Hello and welcome to another one. Today we've got an exciting episode for you. We've got Steve, who is the director of GRC at BlackBerry. And um, he's here to talk to us about GRC and um, probably touching on different areas of cybersecurity. So, hi Steve, how are you doing? Hey Sal, so great to see you from across the pond. Big fan of your channel and excited for the conversation today. Um, I, and I do work at BlackBerry, but I'm not a spokesperson for them. Views expressed on my own. I'm just here, passionate about cybersecurity careers like you are, and excited that my YouTube channel, CPA to Cybersecurity, and yours are converging and hoping we can help some people learn about GRC and how to cross over into cybersecurity. Yeah, that sounds really good. Um, so I guess, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into GRC and cybersecurity, and kind of what led you up to this point in your career? Yeah, you bet. I think I was a very much a business background and specifically I, I got into accounting. I was in accounting for uh, a good period of time. I had heard about cybersecurity making headlines with uh, breaches and in the news and ransomware and looked like a very interesting, growing industry with a very compelling mission to protect people. And it was YouTube channels and books and podcasts and blogs that helped me immerse myself in that space and learn more about it. And it, one day the uh, myth that you need a computer science degree or a technical diploma to even work in cybersecurity, which had been told to me, they said, you know, you're not a good fit. You have a business profile. That was busted by understanding that there are a lot of different roles in the business problem of cybersecurity, which is elevated to an existential business risk. And of course, technology is an enormous component of it, but it's a, it's a team with diverse skills. And there's a function in cybersecurity called governance, risk, and compliance, where you can bring transferable skills from accounting and from business and add a lot of value. And you need a continuous learning mindset and you need to appreciate all of the complexity of the technology. And you're going to aspire to learn more about that. But I, I think it was very uh, fascinating for me to break over to the other side, something I didn't think was possible happened, I found a really great you know, sense of meaning and purpose in the work. It's a great uh, function to be helping. And then I want to help people do the same thing, to you know, to show them that they can break in, show them it's great work, and also to bring our unique skills to GRC and to cybersecurity to, to uh, elevate it and advance it and help reduce cyber risk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sounds like a you're coming from a really good place. And I think that your background from the business context certainly does help in GRC. And yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions. I'm sure we'll get into some of them a little bit later, but there's definitely You're some good barriers. at busting those. Like I really liked your recent <laughs> exam video when you're talking about, you know, people tell me all the time, oh, it has an experience requirement. I shouldn't even write the exam. And you say, no way, go for it. And And by the way, if anyone tells you you can't do it, you can, because I did it. Right. And it's just like, wow, that really resonates with me. And uh, I find it inspiring. And I, that, you know, that's why I wanted to get in touch with you is I think your, your channel is really great to help, um, you know, in, in provide that context and nuance and sharing your experience to help encourage others. Yeah, no, thank you. Really appreciate that. Yeah, I think I took a very unconventional path and I still get comments and messages to this day saying, you can't take CISA or CISM or CISSP or whatever certification without X amount of experience. And I kind of say, look, I've done it. You don't get the certified label. You're an associate, but that still holds weight and it's still valuable. And you learn a lot. It's all about the process. Um, speaking of channels, I watched one of your videos recently about the GRC certification roadmap. And um yeah, I found it really interesting. I mean, can you share it on screen and we can talk about it, go through it a little bit? Yeah, I'd love to. That'd be great. I think um, it was a question that I'd asked lots of people uh, over yeah. time of how do I break into GRC? Um, and so now I get asked that question and I thought um, I'd put this together to help uh, shape it up. So here it is. All right. So first of all, everybody's coming from a different starting point. And, yeah. you know, I was a mid-career transition into cybersecurity, but maybe you're, you know, entry level, just entering the workforce. It, it, it totally depends. But 
here's one approach you could follow. So starting out in year one, your goal is to know enough to be a part of the team. And so to achieve that goal, you need to learn this language. You need to learn kind of the context of, of, of what's going on in the world and why cyber risk is elevating. So to get to that, I mean, you can get a lot of it for free, right? So you're reading the news and seeing cyber in the headlines, right? And then maybe you, you'll drill into uh, YouTube. So securitycreators.video is a place where a variety of uh, security content creators are, and you can check out their stuff, get inspired. Books, podcasts, and blogs. Some of the stories, like uh, on real life, you know, geopolitical uh, tensions and uh, criminals, organizations, and, and hacking are just so fascinating and really give you an emotional connection to the material that makes you want to learn more about it. And then there's, you know, your cyber 101 uh, professor, master slay security, like people out on YouTube saying, hey, here's, here's, the information, I'm going to break it down in a way that is kind of interesting and approachable to start developing your core competencies on the technical side. And then the big search that is leading the job postings, at least in North America, you could tell me about the UK, but is Security Plus, which is um, fairly, if you go to cyberseek.org, for example, it, uh, it, it by far leads the pack. What's your experience like in the UK? Is that kind of the you know, a starting point that, that's common over there? What, what have you found? Yeah, to be honest, I would say it's pretty much the same. The Security Plus is a really popular, so probably the most popular uh, of all of them. But I, I tend to see it as part of a kind of package of A+, plus, Network+, plus, Security+, plus, then going down either the Linux or the CYSA+, plus as an option. So um, I think as a standalone certification, it's okay but i think it's more commonly used at least in my experience is as a combination of the comptia kind of cert package that people go for totally and i think cybersecurity is so broad right there's so many different functions red team blue team grc product security like identity is a career in itself right <laughs> so so yeah. there's a lot of different uh, ways you can go. If we scope it to GRC, I think one of the important things that points me towards something like Security Plus, and by the way, you don't have to do it, even though all the arrows are leading that way. You know, This is just a one baseline to be tailored to someone's specific needs. But your understanding of the technology that you are protecting is the most important thing. Understanding you know, audit and compliance for frameworks and approaches is a secondary you know, if I want to understand how to reduce risk, I need to understand what is that asset that we're protecting and and how does it work. Um, and then, you know, along those lines, another nice guidebook for introducing yourself to cyber resilience is the free NIST Cybersecurity Framework. It's just a 32-page PDF posted by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And it's a very helpful uh, resource to get you started and understand the functions of cybersecurity and it, it does it in a very uh, effective way. But anyways, I have a whole course on that called Certified Cyber Resilience Fundamentals, and I've got a link to it here. And then that's kind of year one. We're getting the basics. And then intermediate year two to three, now we're getting closer to being more independent, not just knowing enough to be on the team, but I can independently work as a consultant and do an audit or do some risk assessments or maybe even lead the team more of us as a practitioner. So some uh, courseware for that. I mean, Simply Cyber is very popular with its GRC masterclass. They talk about the different functions in a GRC service catalog and how to do them. I certainly benefited from that uh, course. There's uh, a follow-up certification on by Accolade called Certified Cyber Resilience Practitioner, which after you learn the fundamentals of NIST Cybersecurity Framework, it tells you how to actually apply them. And then moving into more intermediate levels, the CISA, which, which you and I have both done, and uh, I really enjoyed your commentary on that. I agree. The textbook is very dry. And I, I love your approach to, you know, if you read it cover to cover, you probably retain nothing. <laughs> but if yeah. you break it up into pieces and think about how to apply it, and right, that was a very wise approach that, that you provided. And this is a helpful cert, not just for those fundamentals of cybersecurity that you'll get from the previous levels, but now let's talk about 
the three lines of defense and independence and integrity and how to provide assurance and why insurance is important. And then uh, finally, going into the expert level, the uh, CISP, which, which you and I have both done as well. And I mean, in some ways, I wouldn't consider that expert because it's a mile wide and a foot deep. In other ways, though, like if we look at the uh, that that big alphabet soup, uh, Jeremy, I, I forget the last name, sorry, um, uh, certification roadmap with all of them, they, they do put in the expert yeah. level and it, it, it does have five years of experience and that's why it's there. And keep in mind that this is scoped to GRC professionals, right? So that's kind of a, maybe appropriate uh, there. So anyways, that, that's kind of what I put together. That's the path I followed. I didn't do uh, Security Plus, but I did most of the rest. And I feel like I caught up with Security Plus with the CISP. I'd like to do the uh, the cloud one that you did from ISC squared. Well, the CCSP, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so so there it is. I've, I've socialized it with the people at Accolade, the people at Simply Cyber, with the kind of people in the community. What do you think going through it? Like, do you think that this... Is it any feedback on this roadmap in terms of helping people get into GRC and then move up once they're in? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very sensible kind of roadmap. And I think there's nothing wrong with it fundamentally. It's a brilliant path to take, and it's definitely a very strong option and probably a better and more structured option that I took in my career where, you know, something like this early on for me would have just helped me out so much. Um and I will also say, of course, there's different ways to kind of get to the top of the mountain. So, you know, I started with the CISA, but I should caveat that with I did a lot of the Security Plus and Network Plus and A Plus stuff, not to get certified, but went through all of Professor Messer's videos. I think I went through the networking, Network Plus content like twice because I just struggled with networking. So, Oh, yes. Subnetting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so <laughs> you give me nightmares. But yeah, it's um it's definitely I think the foundational technology, that understanding, that knowledge has to be there. And there's different ways to achieve that. And it's one of those things where I think fundamentally whatever you're doing, I, I think the one thing I don't want people to look at this roadmap or any other roadmap and think, I just follow this, tick, 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 and I'm done. It's more like at each step of the way, you should be really focusing on getting maximum value from the certification itself. So it's not just studying to pass the exam or to finish all the videos in the course and get a certificate at the very end. It's about really internalizing the concept. So I definitely would recommend people to follow your roadmap. You know, I wish I had something like this when I started my career. Um, it definitely would have saved me a lot of time and probably a lot of uh, money too, because I wasted money on silly courses and silly things that ultimately were just didn't help me in any way. Well, I think so, you're saying a lot of things that really resonate with me, man. Okay. Like the yeah. first one is a point you've made earlier in your videos is that the same person that, no, two different people, that have passed the same exam can have completely different skill levels, right? I mean, because yeah. this is not a comprehensive assessment of the skills someone brings to the table. Also, don't overthink it. Like, just get in there and start learning stuff, and that's going to unlock opportunities. And then I did, I did the same thing as you in terms of studying uh, CCNA, CISP, like th things that I didn't write the exam for or didn't until later, but I just... Jumping into everything, Network Chuck showing me how to crimp a network cable and setting one up at home, and the, the blinky light turned on, and it was amazing, right? <laughs> that type of stuff is is very helpful, foundational, and I'll I'll never write the CCNA exam, but I certainly draw on that very small fraction of trying to understand networking. And by the way, I aspire to get 20%-ish understanding of networking. I'll never be a, an expert, but certainly I'm more comfortable talking to the networking team when we're doing risk work, when we're doing compliance work. And, and there's a lot out there now in consumable, affordable ways, uh, you know, not just low cost, but on your phone, on your laptop, in you and you're driving, right? And, uh, and those are all really cool to just jump in and immerse yourself and see what it unlocks. And then I think, if I could just make one more key point. Yeah, is of that course. Take when, when you try to break into GRC or you try to break into cybersecurity, you need to 
make a gap assessment of yourself. And when you do that, it's only 10% certs, right? Like if I were to gap assess how I want to get into GRC, fine, certs are going to be a part of that. But according to you know the career guidance out there, more important than education is relationships and experience. And it doesn't, you got to do all three. And the education things you do, like in our chat right now, unlocks opportunities in the other, right? So that we both did some similar search. We can talk about that. And then that, you know, helps in our networking and relationships category. And then that might unlock a, a, an on-the-job assignment, which is one of your points too, is being applying this knowledge to help it resonate. So um, yeah, I think uh, hopefully us sharing our stories helps more people to, to do the same. And then always, always interested in, in learning the next thing and what's the cool resource to check out. And I think that actually leads me to your Notion page, right? Like I wanted to kind of compare uh, resources you found helpful and I've found helpful and and how they align yeah yeah um no 100 completely agree with everything you've just said and um yeah I mean with resources there's so much out there now and I think it can be quite overwhelming even my own notion page I, I sometimes just look at it and think how can I streamline this where if someone's an absolute beginner, they can just go step one, step two, step three, as opposed to having all these different areas they can jump into. Um, but yeah, sure, let's do that. Let's go through some of the uh, resources. Cool, dude, I'll bring it back up. All right, so your short list of blogs totally yeah. bruce schneier uh you know he says yes. things like people that think technology is the problem don't understand the uh technology shoot i'm i'm butchering <laughs> <laughs> i'm butchering that quote but he's like if you thought the technology was the problem then you don't understand the problem um th there's a big people element right it's 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 it's, it's people process and technology cyber risk is a business any so anyways not only is he a crypto guru that's written his own algorithms, he makes some very helpful points to, you know, clarify the the problem to solve and, and how to approach it. Um, a couple that I didn't see on your list, uh, Daniel Meester on Supervised Learning and CISO series. Have you heard of those at all? Or have you um, I've, encountered I've them? Heard of, I've heard of CISO series, but I'll be honest and say, I don't think I've heard of uh, Daniel Meester. Okay. So I, I, I won't deep dive on it here, but I think a uh, pretty cool uh, weekly newsletter and, and podcast to check out. And then people to follow. It's so hard to make that Mount Rushmore, right? There's there's a lot of gr uh, great people. Probably David Bobble bubbles up to the top of my list. And he was on yours. He, you know, educate, motivate, and his story of, um, you know, his own transformation and encouraging others to do the same. So awesome. Uh, Gerald Dozier was on your list. Uh, Awesome for GRC. And then I thought well, one interesting one here is, is Ira Winkler. Um, have you ever run into him at all or seen him on LinkedIn? Uh, no, I don't think I have actually. So I'm just he, he's just, a uh, I've, I've, I've never, um, I've met Gerald Dozier. I haven't met, of course, uh, I, mean, I haven't met David Bombal or Ira Winkler, but just in terms of people yeah. following the content they post, really grab your attention and are helpful and value adding. And then Ira Winkler, I think he really goes against the grain. Um, a couple of times I've seen CISOs kind of disagree with them and I was maybe more on their side, not that I'm uh, at that level. And under, but However, um, just he's an interesting follow. So I'd be interested to see in a, in a month or two if you do uh, see his post, what you think of it. Yeah, yeah. I've just really just followed him now. I'll, I'll definitely take a look at Ira. <laughs> But yeah, I think another good one to add there might be, um, I think like Unix guy, Cyber Mentor, and oh, yeah. the reason Unix guy has some really cool roadmaps. I definitely check those out as well. Um, Watch and, them both on on YouTube, and then uh, the Cyber Mentor, his early pen testing courses on Udemy yes. were part of my uh, starting out, and they were very helpful. Yeah, same. And I think the Cyber Mentor, for me at least, and for a lot of people. He he kind of helps you to fall in love with it more than anything. Like I think you said it in a way where you develop the relationship with the field um, or the industry, but it's like you really have to kind of ignite that passion for uh, GRC, for cybersecurity, and you have to kind of, 
yeah, first be inspired before you can go through some of the more dry content. Because um, it's very difficult to pick up a Security Plus book or a CISA book and just start from, you know, cover to cover. But if you're pre-inspired by somebody like the Cyber Mentor, I think that really does help you focus and be willing to do some of the boring stuff so you can do some of the fun stuff down the road. And that, absolutely. And I think that brings up a challenge that I wonder your thoughts in solving, which is maybe that's an easier task with pen testing because pen testing is cool and it's in Hollywood movies. How can we do what the cyber mentor did to pen testing with GRC, right? <laughs> so, so that's my rant about why GRC is awesome and underrated. So why is it cool to be in GRC? Like, first of all, if I was the cyber mentor and I had spent 10,000 hours understanding IT so, systems so well that I could break into them, probably I'd rather do that, okay? But I come from accounting and I come from business and my 10,000 hours have been in other things. So therefore, I really enjoy the opportunity to get to work with the blue team and the red team and to be in GRC. And by the way, this department is revenue enabling. It exposes you to breadth of all these really cool departments and the best people in them that own the controls that you are doing assurance work with. You get exposed to top management. You're immersing yourself in these cool networking, pen testing, uh, building systems, engineering departments. There's a lot of growth in the need for assurance. It's a feeder role to get into cybersecurity, which did, I think, for both of us. And it's kind of a, an uncontested market space where I don't think we have a, you know, there, I, I see yeah. a lot of opportunity to add value, but I don't know, like, what do you think of my think, elevator pitch there for GRC careers and then anything you would, you know, yeah. um, add to that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you're right. It's hard to make GRC look as good as pen testing or hacking <laughs> because Hollywood's just done a great job of making hacking look so cool. And um, GRC is naturally seen as more of a legal paperwork boring side of cybersecurity. Um an important but boring side. I guess that's how most people, you know, receive it. But what I would say is like it's just down to how you wrap up what you're doing and be able to market that in a particular way. So like I think the struggle is creators like us, you know, who try and create GRC content struggle to make a lot of content because a lot of it's confidential. We can't just kind of create right. a virtual <laughs> machine and simulate a hack. A lot of the stuff we work with is very confidential and we can't necessarily talk about the ins and outs of an audit. Of course, you can try to create some sort of simulation replica, not based on anything, some sort of lab. But I'd say it's a little bit more difficult to do it in GRC. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's all it needs it just needs a little bit more eyeballs and people to really understand what you do. And of course, there are so many different areas, even within GRC. I mean, I've met people who work in GRC, but literally focus on one very specific kind of standard or framework or regulation or whatever it may be, privacy law. And they aren't necessarily in a diverse generalist type of GRC role, which again has different areas and it's a bit like hacking you know you've got networks and web application hacking and mobile hacking and then even within mobile you've got android and apple and there's car hacking and scada and i think grc is the same way when you actually dive into it you realize well there's actually so many different areas here um so yeah i think maybe it's on us to spend a little bit more time trying to create content in a way that can shine a brighter light on some of the more exciting areas of GRC and also being transparent about some of the stuff that can be quite mundane or repetitive or sometimes seems like an administrative task that you just have to do in GRC. And there are some tasks like that at times, but I say generally, it's a very people focused roles and you're just talking to a lot of people, you're working with a business, you're, helping to kind of support them from the GRC perspective to grow. And it's a very critical area. And a lot of companies are only just waking up to that fact. I mean, I think there's more value 
and I think you might agree with me here, there's probably more value in implementing something like the NIST cybersecurity framework or an ISO 27001 than there is in having one pen test with a few findings. Because oh, that, those... <laughs> that's actually a recent Ira Winkler discussion on LinkedIn when someone said, if you had the budget, would you you know, spend it on risk assessments or getting a, a pen test or something along those lines? Uh, yeah. So, so I think like, in a nutshell, elevating GRC and helping encourage new entrants is why we're here. And you know, we're both inspired by that that mission. I think um, even when you're doing those administrative paperwork tasks, if you understand the business value you're adding, yeah, that helps you know appreciate the value of your work. And even if you can do it better than the previous GRC team, right? Like just that 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 can really make you feel good about the value you're adding and in it to an important job. And that you're adding to the team, and your exposure to them, uh, you know, et cetera. So I think um, it'll never be as cool as pen testing, obviously. But I think framing is everything, and your vantage point is is everything, and it's a good fit for not everybody, but for a lot of people. And hey, I happen yeah. to be one of them, and I'm happy to talk anybody's ear off about that, right? <laughs> To be honest, so I, think, I think I think it's cooler than pen testing. That's my personal opinion. Okay. And I, and Listen, I, right? That's good. It, it, pen, pen testing. I'll, I'll be honest. I know a lot of pen testers and work with many pen testers and have done some security assessments and some training. And what I will say is, like in terms of a career, you have to be in the loop. You have to stay on top of your tools, the latest technologies. You have to constantly be kind of refreshing your skills as you go and if you're in that career that's cool another thing is like with i guess pen testing sock analysts some of the more technical roles the time spent in those jobs tends to be less flexible than grc especially as a sock analyst you tend to be on rotation you might have to work nights you can only cover certain hours or certain days with so that's GRC, a huge deal on, on the blue team yes yeah or, or incident response uh, yeah, an incident response. But with GRC, it's project-based work. You know, the company needs this certification in a year, in six months, or this thing done in three months. They don't care when you start, when you finish, as long as you've got the thing done by the date that it needs to be done by. So if you started at 11 one day and then left whatever early the next day, as long as you get your work done, generally in most GRC jobs, nobody really clock watches but with a SOC analyst, if you want to go on lunch, you have to have another analyst cover you. And, you know, if you need a day off, you have to make sure it's scheduled in the rotor. And there's a little bit less flexibility. And that's one of the things that attracted me to GRC. I think it's like, it's project-based work. You can control when you do things as long as it's done. And you get the job done to the highest quality, to the best standard available, you know, and that's it. It's cooler than pen testing because pen testing you're <laughs> con constantly studying constantly keeping up with tools things go wrong and it's just it never stops with grc once you know the ins and outs of an iso 27001 or a nist or whatever kind of security framework or thing you might be working on area of grc they do have changes they do have updates but those tend to be minor and they tend to be every five to ten years and you've got a lot of time to, you know, prepare for those things. You know, you do have some legal changes and regulatory changes, but again, you know, years in advance, you have time to prepare for them. It's less changing. And, but with pen testing, a new tool could come out tomorrow that you need to learn how to use by tomorrow. Cause that's what your clients would expect. Cause that's what the hackers will be using. So I think there's less pressure to stay up to date with things in GRC, you need to be up to date with things, but the time frames are a bit longer. You've got more of a grace period to pick up on a regulation coming in because they'll get announced two years beforehand. With pen testing, it's yeah, it's a very difficult, difficult thing I to gotcha. keep up but with. I think it's it's so so. There's no right answer, and yeah, yeah, you know, all the points you made make sense. Highly contextual. If the a new client wants a new standard and they need it in 30 days and you're a snake eating a watermelon, right? Of that audit project versus knowing a year in advance, right? I mean, that's, yeah. oh man. But, and then also I think, um, well, it's, it's the same job, the same pen testing job 
and the same GRC job and the same SOC job, all same title, all completely different. Yeah. yeah. Big, small, private, public, right? Uh, government, NGO. So it, 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 it all depends. But, but, but some good points for people 100%. to consider in their pros and cons uh, assessment. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, a very important context, to be fair, that you've yeah. decided. <laughs> and I think, yeah, job titles mean very little in cybersecurity because I've seen two different job can, titles can do the same thing. Very different, right? One job title across two, three, four people doing completely different things, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there are times when GRC can be high-pressured, like you said, 30 days to, you know, get an audit or, sorry, to get compliant for an audit um, or another specific kind of task that you've got a tight deadline on. But I think with GRC, it's not as bad as having, like, to be an incident responder or SOC analyst where you might get a call or something happen at 3 in the morning and you just have to sort it out. No one's going to really... Yeah, no, that gotcha. doesn't no, that, yeah. It's fair point. I, I think, though, it would be cool... If everybody rotates into every job, right, and then yeah, we, we all get well rounded, and we appreciate those uh, those different uh, nuances. I I gotcha, but I, yeah. I like that you're, you know, an advocate for GRC. I think that's uh, I am too, and th they're all solid points. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, now, it it is a very cool industry. I think, um, I mean, what do you think? I mean, it's like the best part of GRC for you. Okay. Well, I think that it has a superpower. Okay. Companies and the executives running the companies have infinite cyber risks. In fact, th that can touch that company. They have finite budgets and resources. That's a big problem. That's a big challenge. So GRC is uniquely positioned to help with prioritization of cybersecurity investments, of being risk aware, and and of identifying the appropriate treatment option of invest to mitigate it or transfer it or don't proceed with that risky thing or you know accept it so and we we have a unique superpower in coming to the table for decision making there with our broad view of risk because every department is pretty narrowly focused on what they're doing in the in the risk of it but something unique that auditors get and executives get is that big picture view from talking to everybody. So I think that's, if you do GRC well, you can make a really big impact. And that's how, is with your broad view of risk that helps the company prioritize so that it can reliably achieve its objectives. Yeah, yeah. So, And actually, if you don't mind me pivoting off of that to uh, another topic, the uh, NIST cybersecurity framework. So like you're, you're in the UK, I'm in Canada. So there's this American framework that just got its 2.0 release and i wanted to kind of walk you through it i just made a course about it but to kind of show it to someone in the uk and say hey like what do you think of this it's this risk-based approach it's non-prescriptive here's what it's all about here's the elevator pitch and what do you think would it be all right if i, I show that to you now yeah sure sure yeah i did see right, this awesome, 2.0 released um but yeah, no, definitely looking forward to the elevator pitch. I haven't had a chance to right. <laughs> well, get, we'll get into the weeds of it yet. So we'll see how I perform, man. All right. So this is the back. Maybe this will be our last thing. But I've, as you saw, I'll make this blog post public so people can check out kind of our comparison of notes in you know some of the certs you've taken, some of the resources in your Notion page, and kind of my thoughts there. All right. Yeah. So NIST Cybersecurity Framework 2.0 heard about it what is it why do we have it well it started it's it's 10 years old okay in 2013 there was a presidential executive order that said we need to improve our critical infrastructure security dams hospitals schools power right how can we reduce risk there and so it says the policy of the united states is to enhance the security and resilience of our critical infrastructure and maintain a cyber environment Encourages efficiency, innovation, and economic prosperity while protecting everything, right? So how are we going to do that with critical Mommy. infrastructure? It's not in the federal Mommy. network that does FISMA, right? So a year later, they came out with this 32-page PDF or 28 pages, depending on how you count. There's you know cover pages and table of contents. 
that says, here's how to do cybersecurity. And by the way, all that complexity that Sal's getting all these certs about, because there's all these layers of defense that are so complicated, and each one is a career in itself, we can distill all that complexity down into just six functions. So we can talk to executives, but then it kind of it drills down into 106 subcategories. So I'll show you, show you what I mean here. So they recognized that we had a deficiency. We needed to fill it up. How can we help businesses that are not in the government but are critical infrastructure? How can, how can they get more resilient? And how can we have collaboration between the government and the private sector because it's a team sport to reduce that risk? And that's what led to this being born. We need it, and I haven't shown you what it is yet, but like, why do we really need it? It's because risk continues to increase with no signs of slowing down, and costs continue to increase. Would you agree? <laughs> would, you, would you say yeah, no, it's yeah. actually trending down? No, of course, it's getting worse. <laughs> I mean, yeah, 100%. <laughs> so this guy is, uh, is Dr. Ron Ross. He's a fellow of NIST, and I, he, he kind of sums things up. He says, the greatest threat that faces any of us today is the threat of complexity, Trillions of lines of code in billions of devices with ubiquitous connectivity across the globe. So that's a pretty pretty big attack surface in the fifth yeah. domain that we need to, to, to fortify, right? Um, and that, that kind of plays into, I'd listed the, the reason cybersecurity is hard. I mean, technology is everywhere. It's inherently flawed. It's rarely secure by default. It's complicated. It's a dynamic threat, not static. It's a silent killer. Like, right, when your car gets stolen, you see a smashed, you know, glass from the smashed window and the car's gone. You immediately know it's stolen. If your email is compromised, you don't know, right? There could be dwell time of, of a long time. And that's a, that's a personal example. What about a corporate example and, and the dwell times you see there? Economics are driving more actors and capability. It's a organized crime, criminal, criminal enterprises that are, are kind of growing. We're in the early innings and the science is unsettled. It's not like accounting that's hundreds of years old. We're still... You know, that technology is evolving and the, the workforce is evolving to shore up these risks. There's a skill shortage and, uh, you know, what I miss. <laughs> so, you know, these are some key reasons why it's a big challenge that we need to solve. And CSL helps solve that challenge. So, um, what, it, what are some characteristics of this thing? What is it, a list of controls or something like that, right? Well, first of all, it's voluntary. So... It does have 106 subcategories of outcomes. What are cybersecurity outcomes we should achieve, right? Like we should have least privileged access, right? It's an outcome. But whether or not you want to do that for your mission, to advance your mission of you know, having an e-learning training company or having an Apple farm that does its logistics and, and billing, right? Is least privileged access something that we care about or no? It's your decision. It's, it's, it's risk-based and it's voluntary. We don't pass or failure, right? There's no... Um, it is a voluntary framework. It's flexible and adaptive, so it can be tailored to your mission. If you are a pharmaceutical startup, you're going to want to protect your intellectual property. And so you're going to be very confidentiality focused. But if you're that Apple farm, right, you're going to probably be very availability focused uh, or, or an online learning platform. So you, you tailor it to the mission you're trying to advance. And then... It focuses on risk instead of controls. This gets into that discussion of compliances and security, right? So one of the examples in the, in the course here is like password security. If we had a prescriptive compliance requirement for passwords of a certain length and complexity, the company might do that and they might not do MFA and because the prescriptive framework didn't require MFA, right? But, but arguably, having a shorter password with MFA is more secure than a long, complex password when we consider the RockU database and, and password lists, you know, when we consider the haveibeenpwned.com and the breach data sets, when we think about something like Mimikatz that steals your, the hash of your password, whether it's weak or strong, out of, of memory, right? There's, there's a lot of reasons why passwords aren't a two-dimensional problem. And, and so as technology evolves, it's talking about make the decision that is, is risk-based and not and prescriptive. And then it's about something that's really cool about this approach is it can describe all of cybersecurity in either six functions, 22 categories, or 106 subcategories. So there's a picture of this I'll show you. Yeah, right here. Great. So 
when we're talking to the CFO, because we need budget for, you know, uh, some investment, we need a, a SOC analyst or we need a firewall or we need something, right? We can talk about the six functions of cybersecurity and our performance in each. And they'll say, okay, I understand what you're doing. That makes sense. We don't want our customer data to be stolen because that would have a reputational impact and a compliance impact with the GDPR. So fine, I'll, I'll approve your business case. Well, now I need to implement some sort of security solution, like you know, hire an onboard a SOC analyst or set up their new capability. I can't just tell the managers of the departments that security is six things. I actually need to tell them that there's there's 22 things, right? Like I need to I need to drill down into more granularity. And then when I'm talking to the networking team or the IT team or an application administrator, I, I need that practitioner level of details of, of specific uh, items. And so this framework is really good at at helping with that communication. That's what it, kind of what it's all about. And here's how it kind of rolls up and drills down, like I described. And, and here it is, right? So there, you only have to do six things. We govern. So we understand kind of the strategy of the business or organization we're trying to help. And how can we help? What are their objectives? And how do we help them reliably achieve those objectives? What are internal and external issues? What are threats? What are risk assessments, right? Do we have oversight and policy for cybersecurity? And then we need to identify what assets and risks we have, protect them, and that's where everybody always focuses. But then the CSF really acknowledges we're not done there. It's inevitable that a security incident is going to happen. And when it does, can we quickly detect it, respond, and recover? So that's 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 it in a nutshell. I think I might even have a little bit more. Uh, it, it's focused not just on cybersecurity. I mean, it is called the NIST cybersecurity framework, right? which is very protection focused. We need to be secure. Are we secure, right? Maybe that's not the right question. Maybe we should ask, are we resilient? Um, and so it's focused on resilience with that whole identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. It acknowledges that there's left of boom and right of boom where we need to be able to deal with an incident when it happens. And it started with critical infrastructure and here's all of the different sectors, chemical, commercial facilities, communications, of course. But over the past 10 years, it has evolved beyond these into retail and manufacturing. I mean, I'm seeing NIST influence control numbers in SOC 2 reports. We're seeing the ISO 2022 update of its ISO 27001 standard, adopting some NIST categories and, and mapping disk control numbers. So it's, it, it's growing. And it's, um, the final points are that it's not one size fits all. And it's, um, it's, you know, it's flexible. It's about understanding your current state and where you want to go and, and how you're going to get there. So anyway, so, so that's it in a nutshell. I found it to be a helpful tool, both at a beginner level to just help you understand in 32 pages what is cybersecurity all about, but also at more intermediate levels when you're communicating to executives, when you're communicating to IT teams, right? And, and everything in between. I've also found it to be a helpful Rosetta Stone or helpful um, parent level framework to other compliance requirements are mapped to. So, yeah. you know, what, what did you think? What was your first impression of what I showed you there? Firstly, that was an amazing explanation of NIST. And <laughs> honestly, I'll we'll link your stuff in the description. But I mean, if your actual course is anything like that, I advise everyone to check that out. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, you're completely right about all of, of, well, all of what you've just mentioned. I mean, I think one thing is that NIST is probably the most comprehensive cybersecurity framework that we have. And another thing is it is completely free. Um, so, you know, you can get the documentation online, but don't get me wrong, every country, every area, I mean, in the UK, um, we don't really use NIST very much. However, some of the standards are, you know, aligned to NIST or um, draw on best practices from NIST or are just based on like the ISO kind of series of certifications like 27001 and others. Um, but I think fundamentally, um, I think I've got a video on this, is where if you've learned one framework such as NIST, and I would recommend NIST because it's free and you don't have to buy a standard and have these controls there. So yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your course? Absolutely. Thanks so much for... Uh 
the opportunity. Here it is. It's called Accolade Certified Cyber Resilience Fundamentals. So my GRC cert roadmap, I talk about how CISA and CISP and, and other cert, Security Plus, they're 22 to 40 plus years old. And they're the established known certs. There's an opportunity here. And they tell you that CSF is important, but they don't tell you how to do it. And so there's an opportunity here for some innovative startups like you know, Accolade and Simply Cyber to bring training inserts to fill a void of, first of all, they're uh, kind of lower cost affordable training because as they're not big bureaucratic companies that have grown over 20 or 40 years. Second of all, they're very in tune with hiring managers. So I'm in the Accolade Advisory Council of Hiring Managers focused on what are the skills that we want to see in applicants that we feel aren't being met by the current offerings there. And one of the top ones was CSF, uh, the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. So that's what the course is about. It's called NIST. It's called Accolade Certified Cyber Resilience Fundamentals. And this is the training to pass the exam. Show hiring managers you know enough to be part of the team. Like we said in the GRC certification roadmap, first you need to know those fundamentals to be on the team. And then later as a practitioner, you can get into leading the team. And it's about certifying your knowledge in cyber resilience, not just the protection, but the detect, respond, recover, the, the cybersecurity framework. So it includes a textbook written by Accolade. So it's got Jason Dion from Dion Training, who's trained 2 million people. Kit Boyle from Cyber Risk Opportunities. He had a course in 2019, 2020 called Get Your Dream Cybersecurity Job. And I actually got my dream cybersecurity job while taking that, uh, that course. So he's, he's pretty awesome. And then it's got uh, 93 video lectures breaking up the content from that textbook, getting ready to pass the exam. I've made seven practice exams. I give you an exam voucher. So that's worth 125 American dollars. It's part of the price of this 200 American dollar course. I have a 100% pass guarantee policy. And there's a Discord server in the Simply Cyber community where currently there's you know, 26,000 students in Simply Cyber Academy. So a little bit more context on who might be interested in taking this course. Starting your cybersecurity career journey, like we've talked about, right? It's hard to know where to start. We didn't know where, where to start. We kind of fumbled our way through. It would have been helpful to have a, a roadmap or a guidebook. And starting with NIST CSF, as you said yourself, is a pretty good place to start. That's kind of what this is talking about here. It's requested by hiring managers. I talked about that a second ago. And this is the content of the course. So you don't get to the NIST cybersecurity framework until chapter four of 10, because first you need some fundamentals of cybersecurity, right? So they take the CIA triad and they turn it into the Siena Pentagon, right? Um, adding non-repudiation, uh, you know, and, and that kind of other elements to why is it that we're here? What is, the, what is it that cybersecurity does for my business? And risk management, right? So it's, since it's a risk-based approach, you need to talk about threats and vulnerabilities and risk assessment and using, I typically use the NIST uh, Special Publication 830, the Guide for Conducting Risk Assessments, but just understanding how to assess cyber risks and for the assets in, in your business. And then once you go through the framework core, which is those six functions going into 22 categories, going to 106 subcategories, there's a concept of tiering. So am I looking to be Fort Knox, super secure tier four, adaptive, proactive, or am I more like cheap and cheerful, limited budget, and I just need some, some cyber hygiene because I'm, you know, I'm a school or I'm a, a small a business. It, it, it depends. So that's what tiers are about, is about determining what level of cybersecurity you need given your unique mission and risk tolerance. Profiles are about taking an honest baseline of your current state against appropriate NIST uh, CSF outcomes and saying, okay, yeah, I, you know, I should do least privileged access. I should have multi-factor authentication. I think I'm at a better level, a tier one, and I'd like to get to a tier two. And, and you know, how am I going to get there? What's my strategic plan to, to get there? And then finally, risk management. So of course, the reason we do this is to reduce risk and to get resilient. And let's talk about kind of those, those fundamentals of, of, of what cybersecurity and cyber resilience is all about. All right. And so this is just what the course looks like when you're in it. Presently, the first lesson of the 93 is public. So you can 
check that out if you're interested. The pass guarantee policy is public. And I just made uh, this one public today, 3-1, if you want to check it out. So that's it in a nutshell. I'm open to any questions. And um, th thanks for the opportunity to, to share it with people. Yeah, no, no, no worries at all. Um, yeah, it looks like a really good, good course. I guess a couple of questions. I mean, how much is it? Did you say $200? 200 American. And that includes your exam voucher, which is 125 American dollars, right? It includes the textbook that is dollars American on Amazon.com. It includes the past guarantee policy. If you fail your exam within the first 60 days of signing up for the course and you've done all the lessons and practice exams, I'll pay for your second attempt and access to the Discord server. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, that's definitely a lot for $200. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's really valuable, honestly. I think that's very well priced and probably a little bit underpriced, but affordable for a lot of people all over the world. Um, yeah, so I guess if, yeah, you want to learn more about that, about this uh, CSF, check that out. It's going to be in the description. Um, and yeah, any closing thoughts? Uh, I am passionate about helping people break into cybersecurity GRC like I did. I went from thinking it wasn't possible to being on the other side, being on the team, and then to leading the team. I think there's a tremendous opportunity for more people to follow path to to see this unseen path. And that's why I really like your your channel talking about it. So please, if you know, if you leave a comment in this. In Sal's YouTube video, if you subscribe to my blog, we can talk that way. Um, it's, it's great to, to meet more people and to, to network. And uh, thanks, thanks for being here, and I look forward to doing it again. Yeah, no, thank you. Really appreciate that. And yeah, um, look forward to doing it again too. Can't wait. Um, and if you've enjoyed this, like, comment, share, subscribe. Definitely follow Steve, purchase the course. And yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks again, awesome. Steve. Thanks, Al.